So hello everyone. Um, myself, Dr. Jasmine here, and I'm back again with Dr. Howard, a big name in the dentistry. Dr. Howard Faran is a practicing dentist with more than 25 years of clinical experience, as well as a noted international speaker on faster, easier, more efficient dentistry. He has captivated audiences around the world with his innovative, informational, off the cuff and entertaining lectures for more than two decades. His area of expertise covers many aspects of dentistry, including the business of dentistry and clinical topics. Dr. Howard was voted number three on the list of the 32 most influential people in dentistry for 2017 to 2019. Dr. Farhan has successful practice today's dental in Phoenix, Arizona. He has also earned with MAGD and DICOI and is currently on the faculty of Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health. He has received multiple accolades, including being named Alumni of the Year by the University of Missouri in 1997, receiving the Arizona Public Health Dentist of the Year Award in 1995 by the Arizona Office of Dental Health and the Arizona Award in 1989 from the Arizona State Dental Association for outstanding contribution made to the profession of dentistry. So now today he'll be discussing dentistry post-COVID area. So over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for having me on the show today. It is a, just an honor to be with you guys today. Um, you know, I think a good dentist prevents a cavity a great dentist prevents a cavity, but the very best dentists are gonna figure out how to treat post-pandemic coronavirus. And these are challenging times, but there's, um, I'm, everyone should always be up for a great challenge. And I would rather be fighting um, a virus uh, than a fellow human. I would rather wake up to being uh, attacked by a virus than being attacked by uh, your next door neighbors or something. So where, where are we at right now? Well, we basically, um, I want to focus the most on the children, um, the kids that are still in dental kindergarten school that will be graduating uh, this month. Uh, I feel like someone like me who's 57 years old and has practiced in Phoenix, Arizona for 32 years, and my four boys have uh, children have left the house, they've turned into six grandchildren, and I'm not worried about a bunch of 50, 60, 70 year old dentists, I think the older dentists should be worried about the, our replacements. And um, so uh, when you were born into the present, it was so nice to have presents left behind from the 100 billion humans that went behind us who built roads, bridges, telegraphs, telephones, TVs, and even landed on the moon. So let's start with the children. Um, they're seniors of dental school, it's 2020 and they graduate this month. Well, let, let's review some, um, some obvious externalities that history has shown us that, number one, if we go back a century ago, we go back to 1900, 120 years ago, healthcare was only 1% of the GDP of America. By the end of the century, it was 14%. It's still the fastest growing and largest sector of the economy in, um, in almost every country, uh, certainly it is in the 20 richest countries because healthcare works as a luxury item, which means that the more money you have, the more money you wanna spend. Um, in economics, what we try to do is when something is controversial or people can't get their mind around it, it is your job to create a question um, that really, succinctly defines. Um, you, the Supreme Courts do this all the time. They try to pick a case where it's a clear-cut decision. And um, the very clear-cut decision is, let's say, that your only choice is today you die or you buy this little blue pill and you take the pill and you don't die. So how much money would you spend on that blue pill? Would you would you sell your house? Well, why would you keep your house if you're going to die today? Would you keep your car, your savings account, your bike, your trike, your iPhone? No, you would give every single thing you have to avoid death today to buy a pill 
that would keep you from dying. So this is what the Mayo brothers figured out in the 1950s. Um, the, the, one of the greatest hospitals ever started in America was the Mayo Clinic. And the genius was, is at the time when some very old grandfather got sick, he just went to the hospital and they said, yeah, he's going to die. And he lived a good life and he's old. And it really was uh, an impact on the Mayo brothers when they realized this guy was willing to sell his farm, his life savings, his everything. Um, it was still very important, even though he may be 80, 90, 100 years old, he still was not ready to die. So it's proof that the only true wealth is health. And when we go from 1900, when healthcare just really started to scale, um, going from thousands of years of linear growth, where you just add a unit, to more like pandemic growth, where you're not adding one plus one plus one plus one. Imagine if in linear growth, to understand this pandemic, that every time I took a step, it was a meter. Well, if I took 30 steps, I'd gone 30 meters. That's linear growth, that's addition, followed by the inversion subtraction. But what is exponential growth? Well, that's when we leave addition subtraction and go to multiplication followed by the inversion division. If every time I took a step, I stepped twice as far, now I'm not adding one plus one. I'm now, add, I'm now using a constant. I'm multiplying times two. So one meter times two is two, times two is four, times two is eight, 16, 32. And those same 30 steps would have gone taken me around the world 26 times. That's how this pandemic virus has been working, where um, you look at the, um, the, the cases um, exploding. A lot of people um, might compare this to influenza. Well, influenza acts more like linear growth. It really comes down to how many people that are sick, how many do they infect? If everybody that gets sick infects one, it grows with addition linear. But if everybody gets infected, infects two, now we're in multiplication and 30 divisions later, uh, we've gone really far. So this pandemic, I have to say that it looks um, promising right now. We see that 100 days after the Wuhan virus, uh, the Chinese are returning back to society. Uh, we do see um, for global, um, I like to go, um, you've all got your measurements that you go to. I like the John Hopkins University site, but it looks like for the globe, um, we've reached a peak. Um, but the time it took to go down the peak and all up the peak and all the challenges, we're still going to have those challenges for a long time. But again, I'm starting with the children. Well, in 1900, there were no specialties. And a doctor um, would uh, fix your eye, your ear, your nose, deliver your baby, tender the, the sick and dying. I mean, they did everything. By the year 2000, when healthcare was 14% of the GDP, we had 58 specialties and dentistry had nine. Now it's 2020, healthcare in America is 17% of the GDP and, um, and dentistry has added a couple more specialties. So if I was a senior in dental school and I knew that the world is going to specialty, like I have friends in Arizona, I have a friend that's an optician. I, who tries on glasses. I have another friend who's an ophthalmologist, who's a medical doctor MD. I have another friend that only does retinas. I have another friend who only does glaucoma in the eye. So here's a simple eyeball and there's multiple specialties. So I see a lot of young kids come out and they want to be a jack of all trades. Um, I, they say they want to learn Molarindo. Uh, they want to learn uh, how to treat failed root canals. They want to place implants. Well, to place implants, you're going to have to learn bone grafting and sinus lifts and, and how, what kind of implants are you going to do? Um, and then they want to do pediatric dentistry and they want to learn silver diamine fluoride and they want to learn gum disease and periodontal disease. And they want to, <clears throat> they want to learn all these, all these things. And I always look at them and say, you're going back in time. We're not going to go back to 1900 where a super doctor walks in your room, she sees your disease, and no matter what it is, if it's your eye, ear, nose, throat, your tooth, your molar, your tongue, she can master everything. That is not where we're going. 
when we look around just the United States of America and Canada, just this little North American market in English uh, journals, there's 40,000 monthly medical healthcare journals. You can't read 40,000 journals. More importantly, look at the economics. A dental specialist in the United States averages $320,000 a year income, whereas a general dentist owns $197,000, uh, makes $197,000. So you make $100,000 a year extra being a specialist. And this makes economic sense because when you focus on one thing, I always hold up my hand. Whenever a young child uh, approaches me with a dental idea, I always raise my hand and say, well, does it follow all five tests? Is it faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, and smaller? And they say, well, no, it's actually, it's going to take you more time, and it's going to take you more money, and it's going to be a little slower, and, and, and it's going to be larger, but I think it'll be better. And I'll say, well, it better be a lot better. It better be go from saving my life to it better be life or death situation because it just doesn't work if everything we do is slower, more expensive for less people. So the specialists, since they do one thing, imagine being an endodontist. All you do is endodontist. I'll give you a case in point. When I see a general dentist to a root canal, um, they will sit there and um, let, let's say um, you, the tooth is numb, uh, you've put on a rubber dam, you've prepared the tooth. They, they go in there with the engine driven and after every file, say they start with a 20 file, uh, engine driven 300 RPM night tie. And then when they're done, they take it out, they put away the 20, they take the 25, they put it back in, they tighten it back up, they go back down. And it's just slow. When I go into an endodontist office, the endodontist says, well, I use, um, I have three high speeds. And so I'll pick up and I'll do the 20 and then I'll set it down. My assistant's already put in the 25. I pick that up and I use a 25 and then I put that down and I pick up the next, it's a 30. Meanwhile, the assistant's taking out the 20 and putting in the next 30 to 35 to 40. And, and they'll do exactly what the dentist does, but they'll do it in half the time. Now, you know, um, Regina Herzlinger is a Harvard University. Um, I have a master's in business from Arizona State University, along with a doctor of dental surgery from University of Missouri. But she has a doctorate in business, and she's a healthcare economist. And she wrote a book way back in the day when I was a dental student, and it was called The Focus Factory. And The Focus Factory is people who only do one thing, they do it faster, they do it better, they do it higher quality. Um, my friends that are in the dental insurance uh, arena, um, they, they sit on the most data. And I wish that data was more transparent to practitioners um, because what they see is that if they, if they pay uh, for a million root canals to be done by an endodontist in five years, 5% 5 of those teeth are extracted. If a general dentist like me does a molar root canal, and I love molar root canal, it's far more fun and challenging to do a molar root canal than it is to do a little filling on the occlusal of tooth number 30. Um, but it, when general dentists do a molar root canal in five years, 10% are extracted. So the first thing you have to realize is that specialists make $100,000 a year or more than a general practitioner. The 120 year linear table says, Find one thing and get really good out of it. And if your best idea is I want to get be good at everything, um, then I, I do not see the data or I, I, I don't know um, what's guiding your thought process on this. But I've only had one surgery in my life. No, I've had I've had a couple. I've had um, when I was a child, I had my tonsils. Uh, I had a tonsillectomy because back then, whenever you got sick in the early 60s, the first thing they did is took your tonsils out. I'm glad they don't do anymore. A lot, lot of these cultural things, um, there's no medical reason for. Um, looking back, there was no good medical reason to take out my tonsils and adenoids. Go back before that, the day I was born, I was circumcised. There, there's no medical evidence for that. And um, so you, as, as things get more sophisticated, um, you, and you only do one thing, you get really good at it. So my, my last and final surgery was a vasectomy. After I had four kids, that was enough. So I got a vasectomy. Well, I wouldn't go to 
have someone do the mind vasectomy that only did one a month. And I wouldn't go to someone who did it once a week. I went to a doctor who does it four or five times a day. And we see the quality on that. So let me give you Howard's um, focus factory dental rule number one. It is very mathematically obvious that if you do not do a procedure at least once a week, that's 50 times a year. If you take two weeks vacation, you're not fast at it. You're not profitable at it. You're, you're going so slow and your overhead so high, you're not making money. Your quality, I mean, endodontists, only one out of 20 of their root canals fail in five years. General dentists, it's twice that many. It might only be 10%. So all the arguments in the world are telling you that looking at the last century and going out over the next century, um, you need to be focused. You need to get a focus factory. And where is that factory going to be? Well, the dentists who own their own dental factory, they make 244000 a year in the United States, whereas dentists who are employed working for someone else make 147. So you make $100,000 more if you specialize. And whether you specialize or not, if you work for yourself, you're going to make $100,000 a year or more. I mean, it's so obvious. If you're working for me, why would I, why would you make more money if you're working for me? And I put my equity at stake. I'm the one who put money down and built a business. And I put in the dental chairs and the practice. It's risk reward. Whoever takes the most risk gets the most reward. Now I know people, they form unions and they, um, you know, they, they don't want to open up their own company. They don't want to take any risk, but they sure want to have more money in the end. And um, that's just, uh, it just is what it is, but it's not economics. It's not how it works out. So if you were a senior in dental school, I would tell you to go specialize. Um, and a lot of these specialties, remember, going to a brick building to specialize um, is kind of old school. Um, my gosh, they didn't even have a dental school. The uh, Pierre Fichard didn't go to dental school. He was the first dentist in France. A hundred years later, G.V. Black didn't um, go to dental school. Um, it was just starting to take off. So what they had back then was a mentor. And if you're my age, if you're 57 to say 67, a lot of the greatest endodontists that ever lived never even went to endo school. In fact, when they became endodontists, there wasn't such thing as a specialty. Just like today, I'd like to remind you, there is no specialty in implantology. It's the biggest controversy in dentistry. The American Dental Association has gotten scores and scores of emails from their proud membership around the United States that says, hey, there's a specialty for root canals called endo and orthodontics and, and periodontists and oral surgeries. It's time to get one for implantology, but there's not one today. Just like when Ben, Sir, ben Johnson in Tulsa, Oklahoma, one of the greatest endodontists that ever lived. He started the, um, his first invention was Thermophil, then it was uh, the um, Nitai um, Pro Forma files. And by the way, if I talk about a company, I have no, um, I have no um, conflicts of interest. I'm not getting money to paid. I'm not being paid by anyone to say anything. I have more than, a month, month, more than enough money um, to uh, not be swayed by that. But the point I was making, Ben Johnson never went to endo school, but when they went made endodontics a specialty, well, they had to grandfather in because back in the day, endodontics was not a specialty because it didn't exist. But guys like Ben Johnson and another one um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, John McSpadden, um, another one, um, Kit Weathers. I mean, these were the greatest endodontists of my generation. And most of them, before there was endodontics, they had practice limited to endodontics. So you wouldn't be a specialist. You wouldn't be a board certified endodontist who went to a two or three year program to be an endodontist. But you might come out of school and say, I, I want to be an endodontist. Um, I don't have the money to go to endo school. The pandemic's messed everything up. But I know an endodontist who's going to let me go work for him. Or maybe a general dentist who um, says um, you can do all the endo. But if you just 
practice limited to endodontics and you do that for a year or two or three, well, I'm sure if you decide you want to go to endo school, that's going to greatly enhance your chance to get into endodontic school. And, and, if, um, and when we look at the global population of seven and a half billion people with two million dentists spread around the world, the United States has a dentist for every about 2,000 people. The world has uh, a dentist for about every 6,000 people. But when you sit there and um, go into um, um, the, the herd of 8 billion humans, half of them live in the big urban cities that have all these specialties, and half of them live in the rural where there aren't any specialties. I can give you several examples in the last 32 years, uh, one in uh, New Mexico, a neighboring state, uh, one in uh, Texas, a neighboring state, but basically um, a, this young dentist went to a town and it had eight dentists. And usually a town has a dentist for every thousand people in America because the rural area, um, for every person that comes to a small town dentist, another person comes from maybe an hour away driving distance from the rural driving into the big city. So if there's a dentist for every 2,000 people, the cities usually have, especially the small towns, have a dentist for every 1,000 because half their patients don't come from the city, they come from the rural. And these dentists would go find a city that had five, six, seven, eight dentists where every single one of the dentists didn't want to do a specialty. Like say all of them did not like root canals or I can identify with, there's only one specialty I would never do. And that is a pediatric dentist. God bless them. I don't know how they do it. I love children. I love my six grandchildren. But if I had to be a pediatric dentist or work at McDonald's, I would absolutely work at McDonald's. And would you like fries with that? And um, so God bless all the people that want to do all the different things. I'm sure there's, I remember when I told my dad I wanted to be a dentist, he looked at me strange and says, what the heck would you want to stick your mouth and your fingers in people's mouths for? He, he, he just thought that it was actually the craziest thing. The craziest reaction I ever said was telling my dad I wanted to be a dentist like my next door neighbor, Kenny Anderson. And he just thought that was just incredibly strange. But my dad owned a restaurant. He owned a Sonic drive-in and he made hamburgers and hot dogs all day. And I just couldn't see myself making hamburgers, hot dogs and French fries all day. So we're all different and that's what makes life exciting. Um, but um, my gosh, um, you could just get a job and, and it, it was called mentorship. It was called an apprenticeship. And I think we're going back to those days for two reasons. Number one, the school system where you leave your house and you go to a grammar school, a high school, a university, the cost is insane. It's, a, in, it's the most insanely expensive way to transfer knowledge. We currently see that in the United States, all 50 states, almost half of all their money goes to education and they want more. They say the class sizes are too big. We need even more. And economists are saying, Dude, you already cost half the money. And then when you come out of dental school, they're coming out of dental school $400,000 in debt. And their best idea is, hey, if you want to be a specialist, if you want to be an endodontist, come give me another $100,000 a year for three years. I think they're delirious. I think when you see the rate of cost double or triple the standard rate of inflation, which you have seen with the, the size of government and the cost of education. Um, in real estate, when I buy a house and I buy it on a 30-year loan and the monthly payment would be a thousand a month for the next 30 years, that's called the, the cost of, of, um, of this house. Well, I should be able to rent it out for at least 85% of the rental price. So if I buy this house at 1,000 a month for 30 years, well, I better be able to rent it out for at least 850, hopefully 900. And the dream would be that I buy a house for 1,000 a month and I rent it out for more. I rent it out for say 1,100 a month and I make a $100 profit. Well, when you see the monthly mortgage on the house start going up from 1,000 a month to 2,000 a month, but the rental rate is still the same at 850, you know prices are overvalued. And you know, historically, I, I, in my lifetime, I've lived through a couple of real estate crashes and, and you always knew when they were coming. Um, well, um, 
gosh darn the greatest investor of all time, Warren Buffett from Omaha, Nebraska. I actually went to Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And in 1980, Warren Buffett came to Creighton and gave us all a lecture. And, and he, you know, you talk about the, the cost and uh, you keep one eye on the cost and one eye on the customer and education costs have grown two or three times the rate of inflation. I think that model's dead, but you can come out of school. Now we're doing this online. I don't need a brick building for this. I'm talking to you. And I don't know if you're across the street in Kansas or Kathmandu or live in a canoe. I don't know where you are. 8 billion people. If you have an iPhone, uh, you're ready to rock and roll. So I think that mentorships are going to come back. And if you come out of school right now and there's an endodontist or a pediatric dentist or any specialist who says, yeah, you can come be my assistant and work for me and I'll teach you everything I know. The other thing I would want to look at is um, online education. Why are you closing down your dental office to go learn about root canals when you could be learning right here on Zoom, online CE? Yes, I'm the founder of dentaltown.com. We have 440 courses on Dentaltown. They've been viewed over a million times. So the, the, the traditional education model is very suspect. But when we look at the specialties, humans, we're doctors. Humans are filled with bloods. Whenever I meet a dentist who says, I don't really like blood. I, I, I like bleaching, bonding, veneers. I'm like, dude, you're a doctor. Who, who signs up for dental school and says they don't like blood? I mean, where, did you mean to become an electrical engineer and work on an iPhone? Did you, did you want to learn how to make bottled water? I mean, you're a doctor. Um, when you tell me you don't like blood, what it tells me is the same thing I think of any time I ever see a law that was written down at any his time in history. Every law comes from a trying, it starts out with a deep scar <clears throat> and it was tried to be corrected by passing a law. So there's a lot of pain in every law. Somebody was harmed. And, and that's why we have to deal with this law, even though it doesn't make sense today or is written 100 years ago, it started out in pain. Well, when you tell me you don't like molar endo, come on, I'm a grandpa, I know what happened. You're a child and you did a root canal and it beat you up. And when it was done, you weren't happy, you were sad, but suck it up, buttercup. You're not, you, you, you think, you think Charles Barkley won his first basketball game? You think Muhammad Ali won every fight he ever had? I mean, of course you start out as an amateur athlete in high school and you do your first soccer game. And every time you kick the ball, it went the wrong way. And it was just a miserable time. But after you played 10 games, you were better. Scale that to 100 games, you're getting pretty good. At a thousand games, oh my gosh, you're the star player. At ten thousand games, you're now a pro soccer player and or a coach or you own a soccer team. So when you say you don't like molar endo, be honest with yourself. I don't care if you lie to me, but don't lie to yourself. When you say you don't like molar endo, have you only done one? Are you at ten? Are you at a hundred? But being an old man, I know you haven't done a thousand root canals. No one after a thousand root canals says, my gosh, I hate molar endo. They go, oh my God, I learned this new trick on molar endo. I wish I would have learned this 10 years ago. And they're all excited and passionate because you're a dentist and this patient is in pain. And I want you to start acting like the hospitals do. If I break my arm and go to the hospital, the hospital won't, isn't going to say, I'm sorry, um, Uncle Howie, but um, we, we don't do arms. We just do legs. I'm like, dude, I fell off my bicycle and broke my arm and you're the hospital. Yeah, I know. But, you know, we, we just don't like arms. We, we like legs and ears. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to you. And I want to remind you that of all the 10 specialties, the one that comes dearest to me is public health because my mom and dad got married when they were very young and had seven kids before they had a dime. And the first 10 years of my life was a lot of poverty in Wichita, Kansas. And it was very nice to live in a country where so many people uh, kept one eye on what I wanted and one eye on cost 
and work so hard to drive down the cost of this good or service that I had a freedom to fly Southwest Airlines. Um, I remember when I got out of school, most of the Crown and Bridge labs charged $200 a unit, but this one called Glidewell only made a hundred. And I had so much respect for Jim Glidewell of trying to figure out how to make Crown so much faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, that people would have the afforda, the freedom to afford saving their teeth. So when we look at dentistry, you have to be public health. You have to triage these patients. So even if you don't wanna do perio or endo or orthodontics, you still have to learn how to triage it. If you don't know the difference between a class one, class two, class three, ortho, if you can't look at this wisdom tooth and decide if it needs to come out or stay in, you have to be a doctor and you need to learn enough to triage all your problems. Well, economics and supply and demand will show you where the biggest problems are because Oral surgeons make the most, 448,000. So when you tell me you don't like to pull teeth or pull wisdom teeth, I don't know what, what you're thinking other than you got beat up and you need to go pull about a thousand wisdom teeth to figure out what's going on. Periodontists make 330, endodontists make 307. Pediatric dentists, not only do they make 304,000, but when they die, they get to stay in a suite on the top floor in heaven for eternity. And then when you leave blood and you go to ortho, you've dropped below 300. You're down to 289. Crown and Bridge Prosthodontics, it's down to 219. Isn't it interesting? If you place the implant, you're making 448. But if all you can do is restore it, you're making 219. So um, I would specialize. And I would work for yourself. Now, when you work for yourself post-pandemic, you have to remember that um, I know a lot of you are coming out of school and you're saying, well, I have so much debt. I have 280, they, they say $287,000 is the average debt when you come out of dental school, but they say that tongue in cheek, knowing that 20% of the dental students didn't have to pay anything for dental school because they had a dad like me who would pay for your college. So um, the real cost of dental school is $100,000 a year. But remember, it's about the same cost as having a child. So when I was little, I had five sisters and a perfect brother, Paul. And then when I had children, I said, I think four is enough. Well, maybe you just look at that student loan debt and say, instead of having four kids like my mom, I'm only going to have three. Um, so a kid is about the price of dental school. So don't get beat up. Now, when we look at dentistry from here, uh, I know there's um, chains in the United Kingdom and in India um, and uh, Australia has one 300 smiles, Pacific smiles. They have over a hundred locations. Uh, Q&M out of uh, Singapore um, has um, um, probably, uh, I mean, it's amazing. In the United States, Heartland Dental, Aspen, Heartland Dental by Dennis Rick Workman and uh, Stephen Thorne of uh, Pacific Dental, whose dad was a dentist. And, um, you know, all these people, uh, there's several people that have about a thousand dental offices. And I want to tell you that um, this is a growing trend in the United States, um, but I'm in Arizona where it's the most popular trend, 18.7% or let's just say 20% of dentists in Arizona work for a big DSO. Um, but I don't know how I'm concerned about um, what's going to happen in DSOs because a lot of these people are built on private equity and borrowed money. And I noticed very early on in the pandemic, the first casualty of war in London was Finest Dental just got up and closed in the middle of the night. I mean, they were private equity and they weren't making money and they were losing money. And you could lose money as the stock market was going up and up and up and up. But when that stock market plummeted, Finest um, Dental um, was gone overnight. And I don't know why, um, I think these are great places to get a job and get experience and all this. But if you have $400,000 of student loans, I don't see the advantage of making $100,000 a year less by working for someone else. It's time to start working for yourself. And, and but these DSOs have, have mastered many things. They always master getting a great location 
they always master marketing and advertising. I think they're best at answering their gosh darn phone. There's 168 hours in a week and they, they answer their phones 7 a.m. <coughs> excuse me, seven to seven, seven days a week. They answer their phone within three rings. All the dentists I know are open 32 hours a week. And out of 168 hours, 32 hours a week, I mean, that's not even 20%, that's 19% of the week. So 80% of the week, it goes to a, 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 an answering machine. And what it needs to do is go to teledentistry. In fact, this stock market has plummeted you know, um, a lot. And what stock has gone up? That would be teledocs. And Teladox is being traded, TDOX on the New York Stock Exchange. And um, it's going up. Why? Because the future post pandemic is that when a patient calls, you need to, you're going to need to triage them. So when they call, I could triage you and say, hey, thank you for calling me. I'm Dr. Howard Ferran in Phoenix, Arizona. How may I help you? Oh, man, I got a toothache. OK, well, let's let's stop for a second. Are you having fever? No. Are you living in the house with someone who um, has COVID-19? No. Um, are you sick? Do you have a fever? Um, are you sure it's just your tooth? Because I need, if you think you might be sick or maybe at work, someone came down with COVID-19. Maybe you're one of the frontline workers in essential services like a grocery store. And I um, want to thank all the people that work at grocery stores uh, keeping me um, my house stocked with nutritious foods of Coca-Cola and Oreo cookies and ice cream. Um, but maybe their coworker got sick and maybe that was a week ago and they're feeling sick. So you need to triage the, the patient. You don't want someone coming in to your dental office sick because you don't have negative air pressure. You don't have these HEPAVAC filter, air machine. There's a lot of things that we're going to have to work through getting us on the other side of this pandemic. But it should begin with a triage call. And then you find out that indeed this person does not have a fever, is not living with anybody sick. Maybe they're working from home and have been practicing uh, social isolation, but they indeed do have a toothache. Well, that's a perfect triage. Well, why isn't that going to your cell phone? Why, why is it going to an answer machine? Why are you paying money for this to go somewhere else? You make a phone call, your, your phone calls, your answering machine should be, if you are having an emergency, please find an iPhone. If you don't have an iPhone, maybe your friend or next door neighbor has an iPhone, uh, but, uh, or maybe you can go on uh, Facebook Messenger, um, if you're on Facebook Messenger, video call me on Facebook at this number. If you have an iPhone, call my number because I want to see you like Teladoc. I, a, a picture's worth a thousand words. I can tell if you're sick and malaise and your eyes are glassed over and you've had a fever and you're not sleeping and you're coughing and, and all these things like that. But I get to form a relationship with you. I have pictures worth a thousand words. I get to see you. Become more like teledentistry. Be more like teledoc. Let's get this visual thing going and get rid of our audio answer machines and, and do the great triage. And another thing is if someone is uh, sick, um, I don't want, if someone is sick, I do not want them to come in to the office when there's, you know, people in the waiting room and I have a hygienist and assistants and receptionist. If I think someone did have COVID-19, I would want to see them at the end of the day. Um, I would want to keep um, a, a HEPA filter on. Um, you know, if you go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's or an Amazon, um, there's all kinds of um, um, air filtration systems going on. Um, I've been posting some of them on Dentaltown. Uh, there's a lot of great threads on dentaltown.com um, that have these, but um, they, on Dentaltown, they've, a lot of dentists have been posting um, air purifiers. If you go to Medify 
metafiair.com, metafiair.com. Um, there's just an amazing amount of technology that's filtering these viruses out of the air. So you're going to need a triage. But a lot of people complain about how many dental schools there are and how many dental schools they're graduating. And why do they keep building more dental schools? I remember lecturing um, in uh, Malaysia and Cambodia last year. And Malaysia had gone from like one dental school to 11. Um, India has almost doubled the number of dental schools. The United States has grown six or eight. Well, do you know why they're building more dental schools? Because look at this data. It takes five to six days to get into a dental office. Now, let's be fair. If you were in New Delhi and you wanted to go to your favorite restaurant, would you have to wait five days if you lived in Kathmandu and wanted to buy a smartphone, could you not buy one today? Only in dentistry are people waiting five or six days. So you bring this on yourself. So if when a person was having an emergency, the dental offices are closed Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They're closed. They're only open 32 hours out of 168. They're closed 81% of the week. So they're showing up at hospital emergency rooms. That's eight and a half percent of the people going to an emergency room have have some for odontogenic origin, um, and that's not where they should be. So, and you say, well, I don't want to open up my dental office and risk all my staff. Well, maybe you can meet them yourself if you're alone and you're COVID-19 and, and, and you triage them over the phone. And when they come in the dental office, the dental office waiting room has now been moved to the car. You used to come in and, and I love it when little kids come in because they're so adorable. Um, a 10 year old will come in and there's his mom and there's his grandma. And you have, you have five people in the waiting room because little Billy is going to get his teeth cleaned for half an hour. That's, that was pre-COVID-19. That's not the new abnormal we live in now. The new abnormal we live in now, the waiting room, is the car. And you're not going to make an appointment until I triage you with teledentistry. Teledoc, but you don't need teledoc and teledentistry. You don't need fancy stuff. I mean, I FaceTime my mom and she's 83 years old. I can I, I can FaceTime her on her iPhone or even her iPad. In fact, she can even throw the conversation up on her big screen TV and she's 83. If my 83 year old mother can figure it out, why can't you? But we need to triage. The new waiting room is the car sitting in the parking lot. You're gonna come in one at a time. And if we think you know, we have to treat everybody as if they're carriers because 80% of the carriers um, have little to no symptoms. So these are gonna be challenging times, but let's first prioritize on reducing the number of odontogenic emergencies showing up in the emergency room. And again, the best dentist repair a cavity. The better dentist prevent a cavity. But the very best dentists are the ones working with their patients during this pandemic. So they're going to start on your website and their website would be a perfect place to start this funnel. If you're having an emergency, we need to have a teledentistry appointment. Um, it doesn't matter if it's early morning or evening. What I tell all my friends are, you can't bother me by calling me on my phone because if I'm sleeping, my phone is turned off and not in the room. It's downstairs on a charger. And if I'm busy, I put my phone on silent or mute or airplane mode and do what I'm doing. So if, I, if you call me, um, you can't bother me because if it was going to bother me, my phone wouldn't be on. And if it is on, I, I, I want to talk to you just like I want to talk to my mom. Um, what's going on? Why, why would you, why did you call a dentist? Well, and I broke my tooth. And what's amazing is when they hold that iPhone camera up, I can see the tooth. I can hear the symptoms. It's great for triage, but the DSOs, if I had to give Rick Workman and Heartland Dental of Effingham or Bob Fontana of Aspen Dental, whose call center is right here in my backyard in Phoenix, Arizona, it's over in Chandler. I so appreciate the fact that with 331 million Americans, you call Pacific Dental or you call uh, Steve Biltz, Bright Smile, you call any of the big boys, they're gonna, they're gonna give you a video option 
and they're going to triage over the video, and that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, the, right now, we're focused on emergencies, um, but that's really been bread and butter dentistry. When I look at dental practices, finances, the ones who are doing oral surgery extractions, basic endodontic root canals, fillings, cleanings, exams, those are the dental offices that do a million dollars a year and the owner makes $250,000 a year or more. Um, now, I recommend adding especially every five years, like wisdom teeth or implants or orthodontics or molar endo or perisurgery or LANAP, not because you're going to be a specialist at it, but because if you do the same thing 40 hours a week from age 25 to 65, you're a human. It gets boring after a while. So I like adding the specialty stuff for your motivation. I want you to learn those things for your head own psychology of still being new challenges and things like that. But bread and butter dentistry has always been pain-based oral surgery and root canals. And because of the pain of the oral surgery and the root canal in that event, that is what builds the demand for fillings, cleanings, exams. After you just had a root canal, you realize I don't want to do that again. So I'm going to schedule to get my teeth clean. I want an examination. And if that dentist thinks I've got two or three cavities that are going to end up needing a root canal. And then if I don't have the money for a root canal, now I have to have my tooth pulled and now I'm missing a tooth. Could you imagine having a finger infection and they had to chop off your finger? I mean, um, so it's still a very pain-based society. We're still seeing the nurse, the uh, emergency rooms with eight and a half percent. Um, so just learn um, how to um, treat these viruses. And know your math, know your accounting because your costs are going to go up. I want you to be an owner operator. By the way, you know who makes the most money? The dentist who comes out of school has no employees. They just have one dental chair. Their phone is their FaceTime on their Facebook page or their Twitter or LinkedIn or their website. They say, if you're having a dental emergency, please FaceTime doctor good at this number. And whenever the phone rings, it's a, it's a FaceTime. They do a triage. The dentist is at the dental office during the daytime, but nighttime they get them triaged and tied over to the next morning. But I know so many dentists who only have, they, they don't have any employees. If they do have one, maybe it's their spouse, or maybe they have one employee that helps with the phones and the assistance. But if they do a dollar, they take home 50 cents. And a lot of these big dental offices that are based on pre-pandemic, where I'm going to have two rooms doing the hygiene, and I'm going to have two rooms doing the dentistry with expanded duty function assistance. And then in the fifth room, that's where I do my big cases. I place an implant or do molar endo. Well, you're not going to be able to do two hygiene checks going in there, changing your gloves, washing your hands. Gosh, just when I wash my hands, you know how hard it is for me to put on two new fresh gloves when your hands are still wet. And then you need to put on a face mask and an N95 and a face shield and a gown. And it, it, it's too costly. So we're not gonna be doing three month and six months exams anymore. We're gonna go back to only doing yearly exams and we're gonna want less people in there. Um, we're probably gonna want negative air pressure rooms, um, HEPA filters, uh, taking uh, small micron uh, viral particles out of the air, but we're not going to go back to the assembly line days of mass production where I would look at your accounting and I would see that your fee was $1,000 for a root canal, but you signed up on all these insurance PPOs, and you, which is a volume discount. You're saying, I'll sign up for this big Delta Dental PPO, um, but you, I, knowing that I'll get a big volume of customers, but instead of getting paid 1000 for one, I'm only going to get paid 600 So the largest cost is this mass volume reduction in fee for PPOs, and this is the time if you, were, if you ever even thought about dropping a PPO, 
this is absolutely the time because COVID-19, we always knew dentistry, high quality, complete dentistry, like the way the late Peter Dawson would describe it, never ever did jive with high volume dentistry. It was kind of high volume, low cost cleanings, exams, and x-rays for the people who didn't have a lot of problems or didn't have a lot of money. And then you had this 20% over here that was really into low volume, high fees. And, and right now, coronavirus is going to make every single thing uh, a low volume. I mean, you're going to have to start questioning, do you really need your teeth cleaned every three to six months? Well, if someone hasn't had a cavity in 20 years, the, the research that I'm reading says you only need a cleaning once a year if you have a low disease rate. This is something you find out in the triage. Um, why am I signing up to do five root canals for 600 when <laughs> it's going to take more time, it's going to take more mask and gloves and all these things are going to add to the cost. No, I'm going to slow down and I'm going to go back to a thousand dollars and I'm going to do this root canal and it's going to take, it's going to take more time and it's going to have to slow down. But my problem with you is you don't know your cost. Every time I go into a dental office, I'll see you leave the room and I'll say, I'll say, Dr. Jasmine Goma, you were in that room for an hour and you did one filling for $1. Did you make 25 cents or did you lose a dime? They never know. You're supposed to take all your costs and divide it by, remember the numerator over the denominator? You take all your costs of rent, mortgage, equipment, bill out, computer, insurance, malpractice, staff, lab bills, supplies, and you divide it by that common unit. And that is the time they spent in your operatory for an hour. And once you figure out that this operatory cost $2 an hour, and I say, Jasmine, you were in there for an hour and only charged a dollar. That means you lost a dollar. If you do that a million times, I guarantee you, you're gonna go bankrupt. And that's based on that you already have a million dollars saved up in your bank today. So I'm gonna need to know the cost of that room and that room, it's gonna take, uh, it's gonna be more expensive with, with HEPA, HEPA filters. It's gonna be more expensive with washing and gowns and gargs and face masks. And and I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if I could, somehow form a, 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 a face mask over my loops. I mean, I'd rather be wearing goggles until I know I've tested positive to coronavirus antibodies. I think the luckiest dentists are the ones that already got COVID-19 and they lived, they didn't have to go to the hospital and they test positive to the antibodies. Oh my gosh, I would give you my car today. I'd give you the keys to my Lexus if I could just test positive to COVID-19, put all this behind me and go back to a normal life at the dental office. But that's, that's gonna be a luxury that's gonna be another year or two years away. We don't have that luxury today. So I need to know when they come in and they're in pain and you're going to do a root canal or remove the tooth, what is that room gonna cost for an hour? And I don't care about the high volume insurance companies. They don't know my cost. Here's four dentists that make $25,000 a year. And, um, you know, if you had 40% overhead, you only have to do $41,000 of dentistry. If you have 65% uh, overhead, which is the average overhead in the United States of America for a general dental office, you have to do $71,000 of dentistry to make 25. If you have 80% overhead, which is about 20% of the dentists in America have 20% overhead, you have to do $125,000 of dentistry um, to make that uh, $25,000 paycheck. Those are pre-corona, um, Adam Smith, high-speed, high-volume assembly line, manufacturing-based dentistry, and those days are now dead until further notice with a vaccine and past the coronavirus. This is no longer a game of volume. This is now a game of margin where we're trying to make a profit and not kill anyone. Um, this is gonna have a major impact on dentistry. I wanna remind you that the greatest healthcare economist that I'm aware of is Marco uh, Vucicic. Um, he was from uh, Toronto and Canada. He went to McGill, that's their Harvard University up north. He worked for the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and somehow, I have no idea how, but he, 
decided to go work for the American Dental Association, and it's been a blessing. And this is the fifth contraction I lived through. Uh, I was born in 62 in 1980, uh, was the worst contraction I ever saw when um, Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, raised interest rates all the way to 21%. We had double digit unemployment and inflation. And then eight, seven years later, I walked out of dental school in March of 2000 and October 2000 was a day so horrific they call it, they still call it Black Monday when the market fell 25%. And then there was the internet bubble that popped in Y2K after Y2K. Then there was Lehman's brother. But let's just go back to the last one, Lehman's brother, because I know all the kids in dental kindergarten school don't remember anything from 1980 or 87 and Please don't tell me they weren't born in the year 2000. But if, if they were born during the internet bubble, um, they were four or five years old. They, they couldn't have remembered it. But let's go back to the last one. The last one after the contraction, the best economist that ever worked in dentistry in the history of since Pierre Fichard or G.V. Black is, is Marco Vucicek. And what did he say? He wrote an article called Lawyers, Lattes, and Dentistry, showing that Dentistry was, um, it was um, after the uh, pan, after the last collapse, there was a, like a two year delay, meaning that when you have a big collapse, people are trying to get caught up on their house payment, their rent, their car payments. You know, the two payments that people will not walk away from the most, number one is their, is their, their phone, and number two is their car. They don't even care about their house. When, when they lose all the money, they just want to take their phone, jump in their car and drive back to their mom's house. And uh, I get it. That, that, so that's the priority. So it showed that after these economic contractions, that dentistry is not a mandatory essential item that's as important as keeping your phone or your car or even your house. There was a two-year delay lag. So we're looking right now, this is April 16th, 2020. It's going to be at least June of 2022 before there's even a chance that dentistry has resumed its pre-pandemic days. So right now, if you look at the dentistry in U.S. dollars, uh, the dental industry is it's, it's about 400 bucks a year per person. That's not a lot of money. You don't need dental insurance to buy your iPhone. You don't need dental insurance to buy your gas for your car. And you don't need dental insurance for the average American. They only have $400 a year in needs. Um, that means that maybe you spent a thousand this year, but won't spend any next year. So again, <clears throat> not a time <clears throat> for high volume PPO plans and insurance plans. When we look at this average income by dentistry, you can see right there where general dentist income has been drifting down from 2005 to 2000 um, till today. It's because the specialist income are going up. There's more demand. If you met someone, if you met an old man like me and it turned out he had prostate cancer, I guarantee you he's not gonna go to his priest, his rabbi or his dentist or his family physician. He's not even gonna go to an oncologist. He's going to go to a hematologist that only does oncology and get referred to an oncologist who only does prostate. And that's what everybody's valuing. That's where everybody's going. Everybody's looking for the best human that could fix their problem or their need today. Um, so we look at general dentist income are making 174, but look at the endodontist at 325, the oral surgeons at 413, the orthodontist at 301, uh, the pediatric dentist at 347. Um, so um, right now it's a time to learn on um, Zoom, on video. Um, we have courses, we have 450 sub courses on Dental Town and, um, you know, look them up. Um, I have done, um, if you go to iTunes or YouTube, I have a podcast on iTunes called Dentistry Uncensored. And there's 1300 hour long interviews on that um, with some of the greatest minds in all of dentistry like Kianor Shaw has um, been uh, graced my presence on there. Um, they're just some of the greatest leaders. 
Um, but I also have on iTunes called Dr. Ferran's 30 day dental MBA. And these are all free and it's 31 hour videos on the business of dentistry. When I got my master's in business administration, when I was done after two years of postgraduate master's uh, level courses, I spent a year summarizing everything I learned in my MBA in 31 hour videos. It's available on iTunes on audio, uh, Dr. Fran's 30 day MBA. It's also free on Dental Town, which you can download on your app. Um, but Jasmine, I know um, you told me 45 minutes I went over. Do you want me to shut up and get off or do you want me to keep going or tell me Jasmine, what should I do? <laughs> sir, you may keep going on, it's okay. We are enjoying you your session and sir, we you are enjoying to... your session. So how it's um, how long, much longer do you want me to go? Sir, well, it's your call. We don't have any problem. People are sending you a lot of compliments and regards. You may continue. How many people, how many people are watching right now? There, they, they are 200 plus live. Oh, what an honor. And, and there are they mostly from which countries? Sir, um, every, I, I think every country, sir, India, oh, globally. What an honor. You know how honorable it is to be talking to 200 other people dentists. globally. Oh, I love technology. So when you look at a, a root canal, um, a root canal is in high demand because People don't want to lose. Tooth. I want you to do this. If, when you think that people will never value their teeth, um, it comes back down to the little blue pill. I think it's funny in economics how I never hear of a prime minister or a president. Uh, they never say we spend too much money on housing. They want the housing market to grow. They never tell their citizens, hey, you're buying too many cars. They want the car companies, Honda and Toyota and Mercedes and Ford to sell more cars. In fact, when you stop buying houses and cars, they, they get very concerned. Well, every time I've ever met a grandpa like myself, and I said, your granddaughter is uh, going to die. But if you sold your house and your car and gave me all your money, I can save your granddaughter so she won't die. Well, every grandpa I know would do that. So again, the only true health, the only true wealth is health. And, and in dentistry, it used to be that when you had a problem, they pulled your tooth. Well, when you have an eye infection, you don't want to lose your eye. But endo, there's so many great courses on endo. I mean, Dental Town has a 20 hour, 20 hour long continuum on how to do root canals. And if you just like watching uh, podcasts, um, Stephen Cohn and Rick Schwartz. Uh, Stephen Cohn wrote Pathways to the Pulp. Um, th th these guys are the most published endodontists of all time. There's so much information on the internet. The, the, the knowledge of dentistry is a commodity. You can find 1,300 hours of interviews on YouTube just from me. I, I have a friend in um, Maricopa who learned how to do implants just by coming home every night, getting on YouTube and Googling implant surgery and watching implant surgeries an hour every night for a year. And I mean, he could have signed up for Dental XP. I think Dental XP is an amazing resource for implants, but it costs money. And I'm just saying, if you got money, that's great. But if you don't, there's even, there's so much free information. Sonia discussing root canals, Charles Goodis out of uh, New Mexico. Uh, I mean, there's just so much information. Uh, but, you know, before the pandemic, bef the, the, it's obvious that the fastest way to become a higher quality dentist is to realize that you're a human and you see everything through your eyes. So just by going from, looking at normal vision to just wearing loops. I wear loops 3.8. And Adonis, before they obturate the, the root canal, they use a microscope, which is only 8X. Um, a lot of, some of them use 12, but almost everyone I know, it's only eight times bigger. And just by glancing at it eight times bigger, they say, oh my gosh, I missed a canal. Look at that little red dot there. That's an MB2. Or they say, oh my gosh, uh, three of these canals were clean, but I can still see uh, material and debris in a canal. So increase your magnification. Um, learn to do procedures that require blood. Um, there's a lot of um, um, stuff about sleep medicine. My my litmus test on sleep on sleep medicine is first of all, can anybody only do this? And I know of dentists that only do sleep medicine. 
but they're not 1%. So these are things that I want you to learn because they keep you motivated. They avoid burnout. It's like my four boys. If I took them to the beach, um, they wouldn't want to swim very long. But if we took little shovels and pails, it's the same thing in the bathtub. If I wanted my four boys to stay in the bathtub long enough to get all the dirt out from underneath their fingernails, I had to put, throw in uh, floaty boats and balls and toys. And, and then they would stay in there until the water got cold. So I look at all these things as fun to keep you motivated and keep you bright eyed and bushy tailed and learning for more. Um, but I don't see this as the public health dilemma that dentistry was set to um, solve. Um, dentistry's problem was still, my tooth hurts, I need it pulled. My tooth's in pain, I need a root canal. But every five years, go learn something about sleep or TMJ. Um, you know, come, come do, uh, you know, I've done this forever. Um, we put entire implant curriculums on Dental Town. I mean, my gosh, Charles Schlesinger has got to be one of the greatest implantologists ever seen. He's out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I podcast him, but you got a complete A to Z 10 part program on dental town. Um, um, you know, the, the only things um, that we have to start thinking about now is when I was young, when I got out of school, we were always blamed for not giving enough pain med and that people were having pain, especially in cancer. They say, look, this person's dying of cancer. Why don't you give them morphine? And so we, we were urged to give a lot more. And then we saw addiction rare or its ugly head. And now we're being urged to give a lot less. Uh, but these are all um, things. Um, if you're worried about getting someone um, numb so that you can remove a tooth, um, listen to Stanley Malamed. He's the godfather of dental anesthesia. You can listen to him for free for an hour on my Dentistry Uncensored on YouTube or iTunes, or um, just or um, you know, or take one of his courses. Um, Carl Misch, the late Carl Misch, um, did a two and a half interview that summed up everything you needed to know about the history of implants as you as you wander out into the future. Um, sinus lifts. I mean, look at um, this guy, uh, Radislaw Janik out of Poland. I mean, what an amazing man. And to share so much knowledge. Um, we got bone screws out of Taiwan. And this is what I love about global dentistry. I mean, dentistry is global. Bone screw, the, the most genius about bone screws coming out of Taiwan, um, the stuff that's coming out of Russia, the Middle East, uh, Canada, Australia, India. I mean, what's so exciting for me, I have to tell you something. When I was your age, when I got out of dental school in 1987 at age 24, if I read um, dental studies, they only came from a handful of countries, you know, France, Germany, Japan, England, you know, Russia, Canada. Now it's so exciting and exhilarating to be reading exciting research from literally all 208 countries. Dentistry, th these are the exciting times for dentistry. Uh, from implants all on four at Elizabeth, Portugal, to Marco Godola, um, who's the chairman of Strawman out of Switzerland. I mean, the courses, these guys are Canadian. Um, it's just amazing. There's Derek out of Sydney, Australia, Richard Litt out of Detroit, Michigan. Um, the next thing that's coming out down the line that's going to be really exciting is uh, after magnification was intraoral scanning. Because when I take an impression, I have to look at it with my human eyes, which can only see down to 50 microns. That's why we wear loops to get two and a half to maybe 3.8, four times greater magnification or a magnifying glass. But you know, when I take an intraoral scanner and I scan that and I see my prep 40 times larger, Talk about quality control. I've never scanned. When I first started doing this with my Cerac scanner, I was embarrassed. I looked at that scan of that prep and I thought, oh my God, Howard, you're the worst dentist on earth. But the problem is I could never see my prep. And then when you can see 40 times bigger, I never said, oh yeah, that looks perfect to me. Oh heck no, are you kidding? You're gonna go back in there and try to smooth out this or smooth out that. Um, clear aligners, why is clear aligners so important? 
when we come back post pandemic, I need you to realize what was going on before the pandemic. And that is dentistry was a 200 year old profession dating back to Pierre Fichard in France. And um, I do have to tell you that I'm going to go back to that museum because when I lectured in France, the museum was closed for remodeling. I said, that's not fair. And the dentist told me, so that's OK. Now you got a reason to come back. And uh, but dentistry has been going on for 200 years. And if you look at the last 20 to 30 years, the growth in dentistry and cleanings, exams and fillings has been pretty much in line with the growth of the economy. If your economy is growing two and a half to three percent a year, dentistry is growing 2.8 to 4 percent a year. It, it, it's just just it, it's a mature industry. It's kind of like wheat. You know, you've been eating bread forever and you're not going to all of a sudden see humans eating twice as much bread every year. And then the year after that, they eat twice. Can you imagine for every piece of bread you ate this year, next year you ate two, the year after you ate four, the year after you ate. Now, these are old, mature industries, but dentistry does have two areas that are growing at double digits, and that's only implantology and clear aligners. Those are both growing 11 or 12% a year. So let's go back and say, well, first of all, let's understand why. Why do people want to replace a missing tooth? And why do they want clear aligners and have straighter, beautiful teeth? Well, we have to go all the way back to the obvious parts of biology. And let's leave humans out of this situation and go look at all the other animals. What is your number one goal of a species? to survive long enough to reproduce, to replace yourself. Someday you will die as an individual organism, but your species will keep living. And I know when you talk about the species, um, there's a lot of negativity. People will think that you're into big government or one world government or socialism or blah, blah. But all those terms, are just negative attributes towards the obvious fact that you're one organism from one species. So here's the individual, here's the whole species. And when we look at that species, when we look at every species, their number one job is they want to reproduce and have offspring and not be killed before that happens. So look at a peacock. It doesn't make any sense to me what the peacock's spreading out all those feathers, but what it is is those feathers, it looks like there's a whole bunch of little eyes while the peacock's eyes are hidden behind the feathers and the, the female is mesmerized. She sees all these eyes and it's all for mating. That's why you do your hair. In fact, before this presentation day, I want you to know I spent at least half an hour washing my hair and I put in conditioner and mousse just to be more actually attracted to you on this presentation. But, but people aren't going to miss their front tooth. Go up to someone. I already told you earlier the greatest economic clarity test is the little blue pill. Here's the little blue pill. You die tonight or you buy this pill and you don't die tonight. They'll give you everything for that pill. Well, go up to any woman that you've ever met in your life who has not yet got married and had a baby and who wants to someday get married and have a baby. Walk up to her and say, how much money do I have to give you to pull your front tooth and you'll never be able to replace it. You'll go the rest of your life without your front tooth. Oh my gosh. She'll, she'll scream and turn around and run away. And I'll say, hey, hey, come back. Didn't you just come out of dental school and you were $400,000 in student loans and you're telling me that this is so bad that you have $400,000 in student loans when I'd like to remind you that your first divorce will cost you a million dollars a year. Someday you'll buy a home that costs more than your student loans. But at this time of your life, you're traumatized by having the access luxury to borrow $400,000 of other people's money because you certainly could have not borrowed it. You could have got a job at McDonald's for $10 an hour and saved up all your money for 20 years and then gone to dental school in cash. But you knew that was a horrible idea. And you know that you can't borrow student loan money or borrow money for a house or a car in a poor, underdeveloped country. So you're from, if you have student loans, 
you're from a very rich advanced country where you can get other people's money while your earning power is $10 an hour, get a degree, get, get, get a degree to now you can pay it back while you're making $100 an hour. So that's called leverage. And but, but when you come out of school, you either don't understand um, the leverage advantage of using other people's money or you do and you just want to complain. But I'll come up to you and I'll say, well, I'll pay off all your student loans if you just let me pull your front tooth and you'll never get to replace it. Oh my God. They, I, I've had girls come out of dental school tell me they wouldn't take a million dollars for their front tooth. Okay, so what is this all about? It's all about beauty. And you look at hair, nails, fashion, fancy cars, boats, planes, and trains. All of these things are done based on the root cause to increase my advantage and predictability that someday I will be able to attract a mate and reproduce and have offspring. And I feel pretty good. I was one little guy from Kansas and that turned into four boys. And so far that's turned into six children. And uh, that's what it's all about. So it's no longer an advantage to go to the mating scene and smile and see missing teeth that are all crooked and crowded and dirty. And what you need to do is realize this person wants to look as pretty as a peacock. And they're going to pay top dollar to replace their teeth and smile and clear aligners and all these things. And uh, just, just go into that. Um, silver diamine fluoride is another classic example. What, where is the money spent on dentistry? Well, you have 10,000 <coughs> orthodontists. You have 10,800 orthodontist in America. I know because I'm also the proud owner of orthotown.com and orthotown magazine that is mailed each month to all the orthodontists in the United States. And think about that. If you cut Alaska is the biggest state in America. If you cut Alaska in half, each half is bigger than the second biggest state of Texas. Well, that's orthodontics. If you cut orthodontics in half, it would be each half would be bigger than the next biggest one, oral surgery, and the next biggest one, periodontist, endodontist. There's no special. So there's 10,000 orthodontists. Why? Because the moms and dads are fixing up their little child. If your son looks like he can eat corn on the cob through a chain link fence, he's not going to have very good prospects of attracting a mate and making you the coveted grandchild. So again, that's why ortho is huge. That's why pediatric dentistry. And what I don't understand in dentistry is this, this, uh, and th this fascination with trying to find an old bald man like me with a liver spot and restore the worn dentition when grandpa isn't going to spend a bunch of money fixing himself up for the open casket funeral. He's got kids and grandkids. A mom is 10 times more likely to buy orthodontics for her daughter than she is getting veneers on herself. Yet when I look at continuing education, all the, and, and it's always a man, it's never a woman dentist, it's always some old man who really thinks that old men are gonna pay all their money to get veneers and bleaching and bonding. Well, if that, you know, quit listening to old men. Listen to moms. Mom is going to spend all of her money. She'll spend all of her money to save her child from dying. And if it doesn't take that, she's going to spend the money getting her daughter braces and bleaching and Invisalign because she's got dreams of this beautiful wedding and this beautiful picture. And there's her daughter with her perfect smile and same goes to pediatric dentistry. So you need to follow the biology of money, the biology of economics. And it's not going to be in treating the warm dentition of some 70 year old man with a liver spot. In fact, when I take a shade, if it's like a pretty girl, I'll, I'll like check like three or four different shades. But if it's an old man, it's just, I just write down A35. I don't even take a shade. Who even cares? So silver diamine fluoride, um, Jeanette McLean has um, made the New York Times talking about silver diamine fluoride. I mean, this is amazing. 
this is so amazing. And this would be a, an amazing COVID deal because the problem is nursing homes. Well, if you triage a patient and they want to come in for a routine filling and you're like, I don't want to do routine dentistry now. Well, they could still come by and you could paint on silver diamine fluoride and going in these nursing homes, these nursing homes, the last thing they need is a dentist coming in with a portable chair, creating aerosols and stirring up viruses when you could just go in that nursing home and go room to room and paint silver diamine fluoride on any um, root surface decay, any pediatric lesion. Um, I think lasers are going to have to be reevaluated in a post aerosol world. Here's the late Fred Mar Margolis. I'm so lucky that I have done five podcast where they're no longer with us, but they're captured on video. You know, you can't find Pierre Fichard on a video. Um, you can't find GV Black on a video. So when you youngsters are out there starting these podcasts, and I've seen a plethora of podcasts pop up, make sure you catch the legends before they slip out of space and time. I was able to catch Omar Reed a year before he left us. Um, Carl Misch, um, just a few months before he left. I mean, catch these legends because history always repeats itself. And now that high speed hand pieces are a little, think of a little jet engine and it's just stirring up this aerosol. And you know that, but you don't think about it. When you walk into a dental office, you know, it's got that smell. It's got that smell. It's in the walls and the carpet and the floor and the dental office. It just has that smell. In fact, when I was little, when I was in dental school, there was a song. I forgot who sang it, but the lyrics were, ooh, ooh that smell. I think it was Leonard Skinner that sang that smell. Well, that smell is COVID-19 now. You're creating aerosols. And I don't know. Um, I'm not a laser expert to know what would be the reduction of aerosols with a ND YAG. I know that you can prepare hard tissue with a, um, with a, uh, a carbon dioxide laser, but I'll tell you what, we're going to have to not only go back to, uh, um, I, in all honesty, I always use a rubber dam on all root canals and whenever I have to do adhesive dentistry, uh, but I'm telling you that rubber dam is gonna to have to go next level. You're gonna to have to get some impression material and squeeze the impression material around the seal so that'll go in and solid because it's not just keeping out saliva, which by the way, on all COVID-19 patients where they have done a saliva analysis, they are finding uh, coronavirus, uh, they're finding uh, SARS-2 uh, in all of the saliva that they've, um, they, they've uh, sampled. So it's not just the saliva, it's the aerosol. So we're gonna have to place the rubber dam. We're gonna have to place uh, pressure material around that prep. Um, we're gonna have to, the high-speed suction. Now, let me tell you about the high-speed suction. See, when I was little, when I came out of school, each room had a cuspidor. When patients um, were done, they would sit up, they'd swish, they'd spit in the uh, cuspidor. And then a virus came along called HIV, <coughs> which eventually went on to kill 25 or 35 million people. And that's when dentistry had to really take a second look at infection control. And it's always one step forward, two steps back. What doesn't kill you makes us stronger. But you young dentists might not realize how much better prepared we are for COVID-19 because of HIV. And a lot of people lost their lives from HIV and we're making the same silly mistakes. I'm um, first of all, when um, I remember back in 1989, um, people um, started panicking, saying, well, what if someone goes to a restaurant and they have AIDS and they drink out of a glass? Well, what if there was an AIDS part, an HIV on that glass? Shouldn't we throw away the glass and use plastic silverware? And it's like, AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease. It's a bloodborne virus. The, yes, theoretically, everything you say could be true, but that's not how we see it. Go to an STD. If, you're, if your spouse came home with an STD and says she caught it from a door, dirty doorknob or from picking up a package from Amazon and the person who shipped it had chlamydia and touched your package and you touched the package and now you had chlamydia, well, no one would believe that for a minute. But now people are starting to believe it with COVID-19 and they're finding it on shoelaces and toilet paper and all this stuff like that. You know how an animal acts. 
you know that if you see, if you ever do run into a wild tiger in your lifetime, he's probably not going to be standing on the top of, of, of uh, Mount Everest. That's, I mean, he could, he could have walked up to the top of Mount Everest, but that's not what tigers do. No one ever saw a gorilla on the top of a mountain in Kathmandu. I mean, come on. So, so we, um, but what did we do? We started wearing masks and gloves. That never went away. HIV brought universal precautions of dentistry and it got, and that started the decline of the cuspidor. We no longer see cuspidors. And you know what's going to go out and uh, what was next is your high speed handpiece water supply. I mean, uh, the high speed handpiece, this goes back to the 80s and 90s. First, HIV made everybody get focused on universal precautions. And the next came up, there were some unexplained infections that turned out to be with the water line. So then back in the day, I sat there and I bought this big several thousand dollar water purification machine to clean the water before it went in the lines. And then, and then that wasn't good enough. And then what did we do? We found out that, you know what the best thing to do was? Just have an individual bottle of water in the cart for that high speed. And I'm just going to worry about this bottle of water that comes from a reverse osmosis sterile water machine. And, and it's only got a couple feet of tubing. And here's my high speed. And that was better. Well, it's going to be the same thing for the suction. The little high speed suction, when you go into a dental office, the idea of having one suction machine and it has a suction pipe going down for three or four operatories. Well, number one, you know that the person closest to the machine has twice as good a suction as the person at the end of the hose. Every T bar off that vacuum decreases the pressure. It's Boyle's law. If you double the amount of volume, the pressure is cut in half. It's simple physics, my friend. And, and you're not gonna be able to clean out that, that machine. And that machine, that high-speed suction, we're talking about an aerosol. Now, I remember going back when I first started learning about HIV and AIDS, I remember so many microbiologists said that, you know, I'm frightened that it's a sexually transmitted disease because sex is not very transparent. And when you have a sexually transmitted disease issue problem, they say you would be very surprised at where it's going to show up. I mean, people that you thought weren't even sexually active. You thought, well, that, that person um, tells people that he, he doesn't even have sex. And then all of a sudden he has a sexually transmitted disease. But they said, but uh, thank God it's not an airborne virus like the common cold. Thank God it's not like the rhinovirus that causes 90% of common colds or the coronavirus. And then boom, 2004, there's severe acute respiratory syndrome with the coronavirus. And then later there was another one in the Middle East, the Middle East respiratory virus. And now we're back to another one with another airborne virus. And by the way, I want to remind all Americans that I better not hear you say anything ever about eating a bat because number one, the greatest plague of all time, the Spanish influenza actually came from a Kansas. I was born in Wichita, Kansas. It came, patient one was a Kansas pig farmer. So all of these diseases came from the domestication of animals. We see that um, sexually transmitted diseases, gonorrhea and, and um, what is it? Gonorrhea and syphilis came from cattle and sheep. They find chlamydia and koala bears, herpes and rabbits. We know all these STBs, STDs came from eating other species. Um, we know right now there was a big study done where they were taking people who were not sexually active, but kept getting urinary tract infections that were not STD. And they did a genetic DNA, RNA analysis of the surface proteins and fats and found it indeed to be coming from poultry. And so they went to four or five different grocery stores and bought chicken, frozen chicken, let it thaw out on the counter. And as it thawed out and there was a little liquid coming on the table, they'd swab that liquid. And sure enough, there was an exact identical match with the bacteria that were being found in nonspecific urinary tract infections. I mean, so, so we've always had a problem um, catching diseases from the animals we domesticate. So it's a bat today. It was a pig yesterday. Dentist, I'm a dentist. 
Where did Streptococcus mutans, where did the DNA specialists find the genes for this? It was came from a cat in the Tigris Euphrates area, 15,000. It'd be modern day Iraq. So if it wasn't for a kitty cat, we wouldn't even have dentistry. But somebody in, in modern day Iraq in the Tigris Euphrates ate a cat and that was patient zero and humans have had streptococcus mutans infections in their mouth causing dental decay ever since. So we're going to have to revisit everything. And this, um, the, the next casualty of war, um, we went from having um, a suction for the whole office and that's going to be replaced with a suction in the office, just like the cuspidor went out, um, just like the city water for your running cooling, your high speed is gone. Um, having a general office suction is crazy. It's gone. It's, it, it's not going to be here anymore. What it's probably going to be is the operatory. You're going to close the door and it's going to have a, neg a slight negative pressure venting that air out into the atmosphere. And you're going to have a HEPAVAX. Now, funny how people are just, you know, there's an old saying, I'd rather be born lucky than smart because you could just be lucky and win the lottery. You'd have to be really smart to earn a million or a billion dollars. So the, the bottom line is who <coughs> has been working on filters the most and longest? Turns out to be it's the vacuum cleaner. Your mother and her mother and maybe even her mother had a Hoover vacuum machine back from a century ago where it would suck in a lot of the air, pulling in all the dust and the dirt filtering out the dust and the dirt, returning the air. Because if it didn't let some air out, it would blow up and pop like a balloon. Well, it turns out these, these vacuum cleaner airbags are the greatest incremental invention that we've had that just has really come very, very far. And these machines are not very cheap. Um, you might know them as a wet vac. You might know them whatever. But there are a lot, a lot of... Um, hundred dollar two hundred dollar machines um in, in america i don't know the prices where you are around the globe but for 250 i can buy an air filter machine that filters down to the a, a particle size smaller than the coronavirus for four for i think 250 uh, dollars is for uh 750 square feet i think um it's um two hundred dollars for 500 square feet and about $100 for something that does about 200 square feet. So if a dental operatory was 10 foot by 10 foot, it'd be 100 square feet. But you're going to have to start having your rooms um, have their own water supply, their own suction supply. And it's not going to be a high volume PPO, Medicaid, Medicare, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, where you're working four rooms at once. The cost to go into that room with your helper to go into a negative pressure room, which isn't going to cost a lot of money. By the way, airplane flights, I know a lot of people quit flying airplanes, but do you realize that it was um, something good comes out of everything? It was actually SARS-1 back in 2004 in MERS, where you might not realize that these airplanes, they used to recirculate the air. They already stopped doing that years ago. They're, they're taking that air and putting it out and they're filtering incoming air. And we're all have been having incremental improvements. But post pandemic, each room is going to have a negative pressure at maybe that might be a luxury, but you're at least going to have an individual uh, air uh, suction uh, per room. And, uh, and look at these. Um, and by the way, I want to pull up this chart. This comes from my lecture um, 10 years ago. World Health Organization list of top 10 blueprint priority diseases. All of them are viruses. The Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, the phyloviruses, Ebola and Marburg, MERS, COVID, Middle East respiratory, SARS, severe acute, Nipah and Henna, Pepeville diseases, Rift Valley fever, uh, loss of fever, Zika viruses, disease X. I mean, this is a list um, from 10 years ago. So when people tell me they did not see this coming, um, they just weren't listening. And, and you were always prepared 
uh, that the next time you were going to be attacked, it was going to be from another human being. And you put all your money in violence and guns and bullets and submarines and aircraft carriers, and you should have been spending all your money on viruses. And what I hope is going to come out of this more than ever is that I hope and I pray that the coronavirus makes all humans realize we are one species and we need to focus on the people killing us from other species like viruses and quit worrying about another human killing you. The odds are you're not going to be killed by another homo sapien. The odds are you're going to be killed by a virus that you can't even see. And I think it's going to be a beautiful world if all the suffering from all these viruses make us realize we don't have time to fight other homo sapiens. We're all on team sapien and we need to start fighting team virus. And um, just like community water fluoridation, uh, I was uh, loved working on that. In mil uh, gosh, January 25th, 1945, Grand Rapids, Michigan adjusted fluoride in the water to level to be of that found in the ocean. The ocean naturally has 1.4 parts per million. And they found out back in 1945 that if you made sure the fluoride in the water, drinking water, was just half the level that it's found naturally occurring in the ocean. And I know that that some people love anything that's natural. And I, so I hope they're loving the coronavirus because you're not going to get anything more natural than the coronavirus or a black hole or a neutron star. And we still don't know what caused the last six mass extinction level events here on Earth in the last 500 million years. But when we raise the drinking water to have fluoride, half the level found in the ocean, and the ocean covers 71% of the planet, and fluoride's the 13th most common element, you had better teeth. And, and dentistry has come a long way. We got fluoride now in the toothpaste at a thousand part per million. I think it's so funny when people are against fluoride and fluoride's a natural element and, and nobody made an element. The only person that could get credit for making fluoride would be an exploding star, uh, which as soon as it runs out of energy to keep holding up all the matter, as soon as the energy gone, it collapses, gravity takes over, it completely collapses, explodes into these heavier metals and these heavier atoms of gold and silver, what have you. But um, I'm telling you that um, fluoride is about as natural as it can get. We got better teeth. Um, we got rid of um, we got rid of the um, um, the the, uh, the cuspidor. Uh, we got rid of having water come in from the city lines. We're now going to get rid of having a, a universal office suctioning machine. We're gonna we got are gonna have better teeth. Uh, these people who don't like fluoride. Um, I always think it's funny that they're brushing their teeth uh, with over the counter um, toothpaste that has fluoride at a thousand part per million. You can buy prescription toothpaste at five thousand part per million, and of course that's never controversial. It's always it's always the 0 0.7 part per million fluoride in the water, which is half the level of the. Uh, fluoride in the ocean. And I always tell people that are against fluoridation, why don't you just go sail across the entire Pacific, which covers half the planet. And maybe when you get to the other side, you can tell me what went wrong with the ocean when it was 1.4 part per million. Um, so um, again, before COVID-19, um, implantology was growing at 10, 11, 12%. Um, my gosh, uh, Strawman, their stock has been doing so well. They were taking money and they were able to purchase with mergers and acquisitions. Um, um, Neodent out of Brazil, um, MIS implants out of Israel, make it simple. Um, you know, that's all great. But again, we're going to have to go slower. Um, we're going to have to go slower. So there's my, um, there's a picture of just 550 of my 1500 podcasts. So if you want to listen to me speak for, another 40 days and 40 nights, uh, you can just log on to YouTube, go to Dentistry Uncensored, or go to iTunes, download um, um, Dentistry Uncensored. Or if you're concerned about the business, then, then download on iTunes, Dr. Ferran's 30-Day Dental MBA, which is available on YouTube too. We have 400 online CE courses. And by the way, if you're from the, you know, there's rich countries. Well, you know, I divide the world economically into three people. One third has a smartphone like I do. 
One third only has a cell phone with no internet connection. But the third I feel the most sorry for is the third that doesn't have a cell phone or an iPhone connection. And I want you to know that every one of the people that is living in those countries, there's nothing that charges you money on dental town. If you come from a poor underdeveloped country where your people don't have a cell phone or a smartphone, every one of our online C courses on dental town is free just for you. That's the least the dentists who by random luck were born in Australia or Taiwan or France, as opposed to being born uh, in the Congo through no, no fault of their own, it's just random luck. I want you to know that no matter where you are, um, dental town, everything we have is free for you. Um, there's my dental office in Phoenix, Arizona, and there's the most important person. That's the next person that's been replaced. We talked about the, um, the cuspidor going away. We talked about water to your handpiece going away. We talked about suction going to your cell phone. Uh, I mean, going um, a general purpose suction going away and this phone's going away. It's gonna be replaced by FaceTime. It's gonna be replaced by Instant Messenger. We're going to need to triage you over the phone. Um, I probably could do that oral uh, audio only, but I wanna do it visually. I wanna see you, I'm a doctor. I wanna see, I mean, do you look sick? Do you have a fever? When's the last time you've taken your temperature? Maybe you need to take your temperature and show me. Um, maybe I need to screen you. And when you come here, I need you to come alone. And if someone's going to drive you, I would need them to stay in a restaurant, which is kind of funny because when I was little, my dad, he saved up his money and bought his first restaurant and he bought a Sonic drive-in, which is where you stay and eat in your car. And I was 10 years old. And I remember people saying, well, why would you want to eat in your car? I, I would want to go inside. And then I was stressed wondering, well, what's my dad going to say? And my dad would say, well, some people do want to eat inside and they always will. But you know, some people don't want to go inside. Maybe they don't have any shoes on. Maybe they didn't take a bath that day. Maybe they don't look very good. Maybe they're in their car. Maybe they just don't like, you know, maybe they're an introvert. But right now your waiting room is now the car. And that cell phone you're looking at right now is going to be replaced by audio. And there's the world's greatest receptionist of all time, my little Valerie. She is so adoring. She uh, loves people. She would talk, I always tell her that if there was no one to talk to, she would probably talk to a tree. She just loves to talk. She loves people, but I'm going to need my Valerie to see exactly who she's talking to. And Valerie is going to want me to come do a tree screen and you've seen this where blockbuster used to rent a movie in in person and then it went to a machine well which one would you go to if you were worried about catching COVID-19 we live in a new era folks I used to go uh, breathe and cough and sneeze uh, in front of your banker as you're saying and then we'd reach over and shake hands as if as if breathing and coughing and sneezing on each other weren't enough, we had to sure as heck reach out with our ungloved hand and be sure to shake hands just in case there was something on your finger that you could give that man and then he could reach up and, and uh, scratch his eye. Well, now it's ATM machine. I think, a co I think an ATM machine is more COVID-19 than a bank. And I think you're gonna see um, a massive scaling of any human transaction that can be done without another human to human contact. And unfortunately, dentistry is rooted in human to human contact. So we're gonna have to use a lot of technology to go past COVID-19. I could go on and on and on, uh, but um, you know, um, this is a, a more business. I mean, the guy who owns a hundred dental offices, the guy that owns specific smile offices, the one that goes to Q and M, um, I want to remind you of this very bad news. Um, the hygienist might be in very big trouble because right now people want to, the insurance company wants to give me $60 to go in and do a hygiene um, where the hygienist costs $40 an hour. And then she's going to have to put on all the hygiene stuff for him and then I'm going to have to come in and do a hygiene exam. That, that doesn't make sense. But I want to tell you, these people got rid of the hygienist 
long before I did, but for other reasons. The only three publicly traded dental companies on earth, none of them have a hygienist and you gotta ask why. And if you wanna hear it for their own mouth, just listen to their hour long interviews. I flew all the way to Australia to interview Daryl Holmes, all the way to um, uh, Australia for Alex, all the way to Singapore for Raymond. And what did they all three tell me? The only three companies that make enough profit to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Remember, if you're listening to me on this conference, maybe you have Snap or Zoom on your conference on your phone. Well, those are publicly traded, but there's no dental offices publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. These are the only three publicly traded and they're all open seven to seven, seven days a week and they don't have a hygienist. Well, let's ask why they don't have a hygienist. Well, this is what they figured out. When it's a new patient, you spend 15 minutes with this new patient. And since you spend 15 minutes, you are convincing enough that the patient decides to part with their time and money. And yes, indeed, you said I had three cavities. I'm going to get those filled and fix these three problems. Well, then the rest of your life, you just do a hygiene check and it's five minutes and you never hardly ever convert anybody to getting dentistry done. So what they did is they said, well, okay, this doesn't make sense. An assistant's $20 an hour, a hygienist is $40 an hour, and a dentist is $80 an hour, okay? So why would you have a $40 hygienist set up the room when you can have a $20 hygienist do it, a $20 an hour assistant? Why would you have a $40 an hour employee go get the patient and seat them and take x-rays when you could have a $20 assistant? That doesn't make sense. So then the hygienist needs to probe and she needs to go get an assistant to record the probings. Then she sits down and he or she, the hygienist starts scaling and that's only 10 or 15 minutes. And then they start polishing fluoride, floss, everything an assistant can do. And then they need to go get a dentist for the exam. Well, the average wait time for this $40 an hour hygienist is 10 minutes. And, the, and then the dentist is in a hurry because he's in another room. She's in another room placing implants and doing molar endo. And now she's being interrupted to go do a hygiene check. So she's only in there for four or five minutes and the patient doesn't even take any recommendations, she says, because she didn't schedule to get that cavity fixed. And that's very measurable, big data point. That's undeniable and extremely obvious and a most weighted measurement that you need to navigate from. And so what did they do? They said, well, let's have a $20 an hour assistant set up the room and go seat the patients and takes the x-rays. That'll cut my labor costs in half. And now we go get the dentist who has to come in the room anyway with all this expensive gloves and mask and face shielding goggles and come in like they're ready to go stand on the moon and might as well have that assistant in there now. I'm gonna measure and probe. She's gonna, the assistant's gonna record. And then while you're there, you might as well just do the scaling. It's only 10 minutes, but when you're in there 10 minutes, you're bonding. How are you doing? How's the wife, the kid, the cars? Hey, how come you never got this tooth fixed? And does this missing tooth, does it bother you when you eat your food or chew? And you're talking and talking and talking. And then when you're done scaling, you leave the room. The assistant was already in the room. She sat up the room, seat the patient, all that. So she moves over and does the polishing, the fluoride treatment, the flossing, enters the notes, checks out the patient, cleans up the room. But what just happened? I replaced the $40 an hour hygienist with a $20 an hour. And I got the dentist to stay in the room from five minutes to 15 minutes. So now every exam has a new patient exam value in treatment accepted and converted to as opposed to the recall exam. And it's that simple move, which is why these three publicly traded dental offices have no debt and expanding cash. Where we started this conversation with that private equity has borrowed a bunch of money and they're under leverage. And the first casualty I saw was Finest Dental collapsed just barely a week into the pandemic. And I can tell by the behavior of a lot of private equity hospitals and, and, and uh, healthcare companies. Are you worried about the dog? 
Oh, it's okay. I have four dogs. So if you hear anybody barking, it's really not me. It's my wife. Is it, are you barking, Jennifer? Are you barking or is that the dog? And um, so the bottom line is they already, I had already been recommending for a decade to get rid of your hygiene department because you're not making money. I go in your office and, and when I go into a dental office, I'm going to tell you what I see on the field. There's only, there's 168 hours in a week. You're only working 32. I have walked in unannounced a thousand times. Oh, I've lectured in 50 countries. When you go to a foreign country, you like to go to shops and restaurants and you want a Gucci purse. I, I get in the taxi cab and I look at him and say, who's your dentist? And he goes, oh, you got a toothache? No, I, I don't have a toothache. I said, who's your dentist? And then he tells me, and I say, well, here's $20. Take me to your dentist. I want to meet your dentist. I have gone to dental offices. When I walk in that dental office, four out of every five times, the dentist is sitting at the desk in her private office while she's paying a hygienist $40 an hour to do a cleaning that the insurance is going to give you $70 for. She has someone else answering the phone. How come when I call you, you answer the phone and talk to me, but when your patient calls you, they're talking to the front desk. You just have this high volume deal. Oh, this person answers the phone and this person's the insurance coordinator and this is the treatment coordinator and she's the hygienist and she's the assistant. And you, you got all these people on a high volume treadmill and that never ever was profitable enough to go public. Heartland Dental, Pacific Dental, Aspen Dental, all the DSOs, my God, if they could go public on the New York Stock Exchange, they already would have been public. They're not. They're not profitable enough. They're on borrowed money. They grow in debt. They, if I buy a practice for a million dollars, I'm not going to come back and say, hey, my office was one million dollars and now it's two million. Well, yeah, it's $2 because you went and borrowed a million dollars and bought a million dollar practice. So your office went from $1 million to $2 million, but now you got a million in debt. And then you're like, well, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. And then you come back and say, well, now we're doing $3 million. And I'll say, what did you do? Did you grow $1 million organically to 2 to 3 Or did you go borrow another million dollars and bought another million dollar dental practice and now you're $2 million in debt? You know, by the time most of these dental offices get to $100 million in sales, they all have $100 million in debt. You're looking at the only three ones that don't have debt. They also don't have hygienists. They also have, a, uh, I mean, it, it is what it is, folks. It's no longer a high volume PPO game with you doing this on borrowed money. You know what I'd do if I was a dentist? I just graduated. I graduated May 11. I got in my dental office with no money down. How did I do that? I went and I saw this place I wanted to rent. It was a nice commercial area on a four lane intersection next to a grocery store and a bank. And I told the landlord, I said, how, how much to rent this? And he said, $10 a square foot for a three year lease, thousand square foot. And I said, well, instead of $10 a square foot, I'll pay you 20. And instead of three years, I'll, I'll, I'll sign for five because I want you to do my build out. I, you, you built this whole 20 acre center. I don't, I don't know how to do building. I'm a dentist. You built this whole center, build out my dental office. Then I went to the dental equipment store and I said, fill this up with the finest equipment you got. And they got all excited and happy and started drooling saliva. And, and they, they gave me 80, they picked out $85,000 worth of dental equipment. And I said, that's what I want. And they go, well, will you give me the check for 85,000? I said, are you kidding me? I just walked out of dental school. I have $87,000 of student loans. That's in 1987 dollars. That'd be $200,000 a year in 2020 dollars. I said, I don't have a dime. You give me that equipment and I'm going to break, break it down into five years, 60 month payments. And when I give you the last payment, it's all mine. I said, it's, it's that you want 100% of something or 100% of nothing. And they said, okay, we'll do it. We'll give you 87,000. See, that's other people's money. I had student loans. I had the landlord built out my office. I paid him back with his money. I sit there, I got all my dental. I got into a dental office with no money down. And my hours were seven to seven, seven days a week, just like these guys. And I didn't start hiring hygienists until I was so busy doing 
fillings and crowns and root canals that I that I thought it, it, I shouldn't be spending my time doing something for a hundred dollars if I could be spending that same hour doing something for two or three hundred dollars. But that was before the high volume pandemic hit. And these people are the ones making all the profit dollars. These companies grow in earnings. When they want to go build a new million dollars office, they build it with a million dollars of their own profit. That's not what I see in America. That's not what I see with DSOs. I, it's all debt, 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 other people's money buying, other people's dental offices. It, it's a, uh, and, and when I say DSOs, remember, there's, there's 500 DSOs. I know when you say DSO in America, you think of Heartland and Aspen and Pacific, but Rick Workman and Bob Fontana and um, Steve are um, very, very, very unique and special and gifted. And I'm talking about your average DSO, but they're all do this and borrow money. And those days are gone. So I'd get out of school. I'd rent something about the size of 400 square foot I'd have one office in there. I'd have one employee. I'd have one iPhone. And I would sit there and I would be, as my friend Rick Kirshner always says, I would be mean and lean. And I would set your own fee. And I would make sure at the end of every month that the fees you collected uh, paid for twice of your cost. So you'd have a 50% profit margin, low volume dental office. And uh, the hygienist, um, the, the, it's, the, I think the hygienist, the cuspidor, the water, city water for your high speed, and a office general suction line are not going to come back until we have a vaccination and that I can test my workforce for having antibodies for COVID-19. And I can, um, it, you know, if, if I knew that my entire office had antibodies for COVID-19, then that means this too passed. And are we going to get to a point in time when we know that everybody has had a vaccine and the vaccine was tested to make sure it worked by that you tested positive for coronavirus 2 um, antibodies? Yeah. Is that going to happen? Of course we landed on the moon, dude. It's going to happen. But it's not going to happen in 2020 and it's not going to happen in 2021. It At the earliest, maybe 2022. So on, um, so that's how you have to think. And um, congratulations to uh, Bob Fontana, who's still trying to see patients, and Rick Workman, who rolled out teledentistry um, just within hours of this pandemic. He was texting me more than Gordon Christian at the beginning of the pandemic. You could just see his texting. He was finding all the people that he needed to know to find the right answers. This guy was talking to the Surgeon General of the United States. Rick Workman looked like, a, he looked like Genghis Khan running through the pandemic virus of coronavirus and they were fearless. And I want you to be for this. Stephen Thorne, uh, thanks for all that you taught everyone. And I make no money from these guys. In fact, those three guys have never given me a dollar. I podcast them for free. So if you don't like my arguments, if the first thing you can do is just question my motives, well, that's because that just means my idea was solid because if I said Stephen Thorne has a call center a hundred times better than you, and all you can say is, oh, he paid you to say that or, or you're fat. Well, you, you, don't, you don't have an argument, dude. These are the smartest operators in the world. Patrick Bauer is the secret sauce of Heartland Dental. He runs a thousand offices. I assure you that a man running a thousand offices knows more than me who only runs one. So again, um, you told me an hour. I'm now at two hours. Where is Jasmine? How are you doing, Jasmine? Yes, sir. Hello, Jasmine. How are you doing? Sir, I'm doing great. I'm uh, looking uh, towards the response of people. They are very happy. All right, and but are you yeah. happy? I'm really happy. It was really a wonderful session, and I was looking that 250, more than 250 people joined our session, and a lot of people, they are sending regards to you on Facebook. They said what? 
lot of people they are sending regards to you on facebook people are even asking whether the session is being recorded or not so i want yeah. to tell them that we have recorded this session and you may find it on facebook as well um i i have um dental town has a facebook page and i had a facebook page at howard ferrand and i had 300,000 followers but i don't um i don't do facebook anymore i i quit posting on facebook even though facebook is owned by mark zuckerberg and his dad is a dentist and friend of mine and has come on my show once a year but the problem with facebook is that great dentists send me videos and i post it on dental town twitter um uh, twitter at howard fran or linkedin at howard fran or instagram which is owned by facebook and i never have a problem but 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 facebook um i i made a post on facebook and they banned me for a month because of a copyright infringement and i'm like well i posted on your instagram twitter pinterest dental town and then so for 30 days they banned me and then some other dentist sent me a video this is all their fault this is all your your followers faults they sent me a great video and i posted that and then they banned me another 30 days and you know after they banned me twice i said you know fool me once it's my fault but you're not fooling me enough. you know if mark zuckerberg's best idea is to ban a dentist who's 57 with 300,000 followers oh my god and 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 not ban me on so so my ban is over i can go back i guess to facebook but i'm i have no plans to going back to facebook um because old people like me are on dental town and linkedin and twitter like the president of the united states only became the president because he had 50 million people following on twitter when i'm in dentistry if you own a dental company you're on linkedin if you're old you're on twitter and they're all on dental town we have 275,000 members but the reason i'm not going to go back to facebook but just do the instagram is cuz i know all the young kids like you look very very young i bet you anything you're on instagram are you yes yes yeah say say and i bet your grandma's not is your grandma on instagram uh, yeah i know i don't have my grandmom right now and she's no what more about, with me what about your mom Yeah, she's on Instagram. She's on Facebook. She uses oh. everything. Well, you have a young hip mother. Um, yeah. But, um, but but you know what? But what I like, but what I like the most is is um, here's what I don't like about social media. Let's say that um, Jasmine um, posted something. That, uh, say it was about uh, something that I remember later, and I need to go back and find that post. Well, I don't want to go back to your page and scroll back forever. What's beautiful about Dental Town is it's a message board index. So I can go on to Dental Town. There's 275,000 dentists. They've posted 6 million posts. And I could go in there and I could I could type in your name. Boom, pulls it right up. Or or say so say I was having a problem with a HEPA filter. I can go and I don't remember which one of my Facebook friends was talking about a HEP filter. Well, I'm going to Dental Town, type in HEP filter and pull up every thread. So when I go to the NASA, when I go to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is at ASU where I went to has NASA labs, none of them are doing any research on social media which is a FIFO. Uh first in or last in first out it's all lifo it's more for an entertaining experience if you go to any research industry institution it's a message board because all of your data is indexed so when you go to dental town and let's say that you 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 were deciding you wanted to buy a microscope and you didn't know if you should buy one from global in st louis or if you should buy one from um you know another company in korea you could type in the brand name say say you were looking at um global microscopes you could just type in global microscopes and pull up every single thread that was ever discussed global microscopes where i i don't know i can't do that on facebook or instagram i look at facebook and instagram and twitter and linkedin as as lifo 
last in, first out. You just get, it's kind of like watching the news. You know, you turn on the news, they don't start the news with what happened, uh, that there was an accident building the pyramid and he's uh, 5,000 years ago today, Charles fell off a brick. No, no they, they talk about the daily news. So you, you, you turn on the news, you turn on social media, it's fun, it's entertaining, it's what's happening today. But it's not for trying to learn how to do a root canal faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost. If I cannot find an MB2, I wanna to go to Dentaltown where 275,000 dentists for 20 years have shared everything they know about MB2, type in MB2, which searches the whole index instantly and start reading for an hour on finding the MB2. I can't, I've never had that experience on social media. So maybe I'm old fashioned. Maybe you're looking at me thinking he's just an old grandpa, but um, I prefer Dentaltown. You can download the app. It's free and, and you don't have to worry about um, all the other problems you have on social media. Like, like I noticed on Facebook, if you make a post, they know it's you. Yeah. But if you got a really embarrassing question on Dentaltown, you might be just smiley tooth. And then you can post the root canal that you did that turned out upside down. And then everybody can help you and, and uh, without having to know it was you. Okay. Great. So again, thank you for having me on the show today. It was an honor. And now I have the extreme honor of taking my granddaughter to lunch today. So. <laughs>